Are we set, Christine? Yes. All right. Well, welcome everybody um, on this partially snowy, cold, wet, uh, free spring day. Uh, every day we get a little closer to that magic mark. Um, I guess the groundhog might have been correct again this year. Um, I'm delighted uh, to be able to introduce our presenter today. I've known Erica for uh, quite a little while now. Uh, Dr. Miller uh, holds a Bachelor of Science degree and her veterinary, uh, Doctor of Veterinary Medicine degree from Oklahoma State University. She's been involved with wildlife rehabilitation for some 25 years. And close to us, she has been very involved with uh, the Trump State Bird Rescue and Research uh, Center, uh, has been involved with the Brandywine Zoo. Uh, but about since, uh, 2015, she sort of I'll say straight away from full-time wildlife rehabilitation uh, efforts, but remained and, and interested uh, in uh, the wildlife field. In 2019, uh, Erica uh, took on an interim wildlife veterinary position with the Pennsylvania Game Commission and has been with them uh, sort of ever since. Uh, as you all recall, this last year, uh, we had an incident uh, uh, called the mystery bird disease. And many of us or all of us were involved in one way or another, dealing with feeders and monitoring birds uh, during the uh, summer months into early fall. And Erica and her team have been very involved uh, with that uh, uh, disease and trying to find out what's going on. Uh, so I'm pleased to introduce Erica Miller, uh, who is the operations manager for the Wildlife Futures Program at the University of Pennsylvania in association with the Pennsylvania Game Commission. And she'll tell us a bit more about that. But uh, equally important, I think, uh, Eric is the adjunct associate professor for wildlife medicine at the University of Pennsylvania School of Veterinary Medicine. So with that, I'm going to turn it off to Erica, and uh, she'll fill us in on all the details. Okay, thank you for the nice introduction. That's actually going to shorten a little bit about what I was going to do, and I'm going to try to share my screen here. Hopefully this will look well, and I'm hoping you can see that. Um, it should say songbird morbidity mortality event 2021. So, yes, we can see good. it. Excellent. Um, I can't see much of you anymore, so um, <laughs> appreciate that. Um, I'm going to move this out of my way. There we go. Now I think we are. I'm good to go. So again, thank you for asking me to talk about this. This is. Uh, as I say, this is a morbidity event talking about sickness in birds or illness, as well as a mortality event um, because it ended up with actually all of the birds dying. And I'm gonna give you a, a spoiler alert. I don't have a final answer, uh, but I do have some interesting information and I hope I'm gonna give you some things to think about along the way. So, my plan is to, I was gonna give you a little about, about my background, though Dr. Raymond did that quite well already. So I'll, I'll just zip through that, talk a, briefly about the Wildlife Futures Program, and then dive into the event that occurred this last summer. And I'm gonna talk about a few other diseases of concerns in, in songbirds and other birds along the way. So um, as Wilbur said, I got my degrees from um, Oklahoma State University. At the time, as shown in this picture, I was the only student in my class interested in wildlife. Um, and this was one of my first patients in school uh, that I was getting ready to release after treatment. Um, from there, I went to um, Willowbrook Wildlife Center outside of Chicago, where I uh, had the opportunity to work with a variety of injured native wildlife, such as this deer. Um, 
And then from there, I moved to warmer climates, spent some time on the coast of North Carolina at a rehabilitation center where it was um, I, where I was able to treat coastal animals like sea turtles and sea birds. Then spent um, most of my career at Tri-State Bird Rescue. Um, here we're removing a lead sinker from a northern gannet that had uh, swallowed fishing tackle. And as Wilbur said, I spent quite a bit of time doing oil spill response, including um, responding to the Deepwater Horizon spill in 2010. Uh, during this time, again, and what he didn't say was it's thanks to to Dr. Amen that I began teaching wildlife medicine at the vet school in um, Philadelphia, University of Pennsylvania. And I've been doing that for 25 years now. Um, one of my favorite uh, jobs on the side, I'll say a part-time jobs is working for the New Jersey Division of Fish and Wildlife. Um, here we're, I'm placing a bald eagle chick back in the nest after collecting a blood sample from it. And I should point out that the squirrel in the nest was a kind of peace offering. It was a, a road killed squirrel we picked up on the way there. And uh, we always try to leave something in the nest after disturbing them for, um, so that we can handle and ban the chicks. So uh, I, as Wilbur said, I worked part-time at the Brandywine Zoo for a few years. Uh, this is doing surgery on their sloth. Uh, and then, I've been volunteering for the last nine years on Project Snowstorm. Uh, my role there is to examine birds that don't survive the winter in order to get a better understanding of the challenges that they face when they come down from the Arctic in these mass uh, numbers known as the eruptions. And most recently, I've been working with the Game Commission and the Wildlife Futures Program where every now and then I get to do really fun things like hugging, I, I mean, examining uh, bear cubs during den exhibits. Um, but most of my time is spent uh, in front of the computer where I'm managing our field team. So with that, I'll jump into what the Wildlife Futures Program is. It, it's a relatively new partnership, just over two years old between the Pennsylvania Game Commission and the uh, Pennsylvania, University of Pennsylvania Veterinary School. And we provide wildlife health surveillance research and response to improve wildlife management in Pennsylvania and in the surrounding states. Uh, because it's a close partnership with the Game Commission, we do have a focus on Pennsylvania, but we do have partnerships with other states as well for specific research projects. Um, so our program utilizes my field staff to collect samples for disease surveillance or diagnostic. So um, they respond to reports of, of dead birds or dead mammals, and they will then collect the correct samples needed for diagnostics. So we can either determine why they died, or if it's a species we're interested, um, we just do routine um, surveillance on them. We also do some projects in conjunction with the Game Commission um, on live animals. So like right now we're trapping and sampling turkeys to do a surveillance for turkey various turkey diseases. We work with the vet school and other organizations to develop new research tools. We train veterinary students, biologists, rehabilitators, other colleagues. Uh, we also provide veterinary support to the game commission. And we're developing a regional database on wildlife diseases. Whoops. All right, that changed um, so that we can um, help track um, wildlife diseases in the area. And we are establishing a biorepository to be able to store tissues um, and save them for future research efforts. Now jumping into this. Um, so much of our initial work has been responding to current and potential disease threats including developing tests for SARS-CoV-2 in bats, mink, deer, and other wildlife species, uh, and conducting surveillance in the, those species. We're conducting risk assessments and developing response plans. Should uh, rabbit hemorrhagic disease virus be found in Pennsylvania, 
this virus has been causing die-offs uh, in rabbits in 11 states in the western part of the U.S., and we feel it's only a matter of time before it moves east. Uh, we've been responding to various mortality events, such as the songbird event I'm going to talk about next, and, and addressing other emerging diseases, such as high path avian influenza, which I'll, I'll touch on as well. So, so to jump into the songbird event, I'd like to sort of walk you through the event and share some information that we have about it, what we've done to investigate it, and, and give you some, like I said, some food for thought. So it started around May 10th, where's the first known cases that showed up in the DC and Maryland area. And by, and um, these were mainly common grackles, European starlings. And most of these were just showing neurologic disease. They were young birds that um, had tremors that they couldn't uh, explain any other reason for them. Um, some of them had, couldn't hold their heads up properly. They were just weak and, and sort of neurologic. By the third week uh, in May, they, we started getting reports from um, rehab, rehabilitators in Maryland that they had large numbers of grackles now coming in, as well as blue jays, and they all had swollen eyes. Um, and so different degrees of conjunctivitis or discharge from the eyes and, and corneal edema or swelling and, and cloudiness in the cornea of the eye. And by mid-June, it had spread to at least eight states. I, I, I use spread loosely. We don't know whether it was actually spreading or just showing up um, independently, but it had, was being found in, in eight states. And we know it was affecting at least eight species. We had sporadic reports of um, individuals of other species, but it was um, mainly uh, these group of eight species. July, the numbers started to slow down to almost a trickle. And by mid-August, um, all the states that had been involved said they were getting no more reports of these uh, birds. So it was a relatively short duration and it just seemed to end almost as quickly as it started. So many of the, these are, are the main eight species that we saw affected. Um, Many of these are seed feeders. However, keep in mind that all of these birds seed feed insects to their young during this time of year. So remember, this is one of the things I said, the timing and that timeline is important is it was the May to early August um, when there were young birds in the nest. Um, so these first five were the species that were most commonly affected. We saw smaller numbers of mockingbirds, robins, and cowbirds, but enough that um, we really do think that's significant. And then sporadic um, reports that were not really confirmed of, of other species involved. The next thing to look at and consider in this is the age of the affected birds. The only ones that ended up having clinical signs or or, or visual symptoms or problems from this event were all fledglings. So these were all birds that as fledgling songbirds, they're in the 10 to 21 day old range. So very young birds, um, many of them were still in the nest or just leaving the nest. And this is kind of a stressful time for these birds and in a normal year because they're, they're learning to fly, they might be first out of the nest trying to forage on their own. The regular feeding by the adults have started to drop off so that they can start picking up food on their own. So a, a big change, they're experiencing normal stress factors and they're, uh, it, like I said, in a normal year, it can be stressful. Um, while they are generally not feeding from feeders themselves, at this time, the adults are still visiting feeders, in fact, feeding, visiting feeders more as the adults are shifting from an insect diet um, more to their normal seed diet. 
And so this was our reasoning in asking people to take down the feeders and bird baths, mainly to just discourage people for, or the birds from congregating and potentially spreading the disease if indeed this was a transmissible disease. So when the disease or whatever the condition was, when, when these first cases started appearing in Maryland, the first thing that the rehabilitators thought was that this might be what's typically known um, as Finch conjunctivitis. Oop, I don't think I'm on the right slide, am I? Oop, I'm not. I jumped ahead, I apologize, in, in my viewing. I uh, want to talk about the clinical signs. Uh, so, so whatever was happening, it was affecting um, the bird's eyes and, and or their neurologic system. So a few had only the neurologic signs or only the ocular signs or the eye signs and, and some had both. Um, so when the eyes were affected, it was this conjunctivitis as we see in this um, little blue jay here, a lot of swelling around the eyes, often a crusty discharge where the eyes were matted shut. Um, and as I'll show in a later picture that this corneal edema where the eyes were, appeared white. Um, and there was just a kind of a fluid buildup in the layers of the cornea. Uh, neurologic wise, again, we had these tremors, sometimes falling over um, a head twist on the birds that they couldn't hold the head up properly. And, and the overall sign was death. Um, absolutely none of the birds involved survived. Um, after several weeks, most of the rehabilitators uh, simply gave up treating and were afraid that it might be something contagious that could spread to other birds in their, in their facilities. And so they were humanely euthanized on arrival. Um, but those that did attempt treatment, nothing, nothing seemed to work. So as I had accidentally jumped ahead before my thoughts, um, when, when the cases first started showing up in early May, the rehabilitators thought it might be kind of a new outbreak of what is commonly known as Finch conjunctivitis or this infection caused by mycoplasmic allocepticum. Now, this first appeared in house finches in the Northeast around 1994. Um, this was a poultry disease, common or not, not so uncommon in chickens and would cause a conjunctivitis and upper respiratory infection in chickens. Um, now suddenly in 1994, it appeared to be affecting house finches. And we have seen this ever since 1994, it slowly spread across the, the US and um, it's pretty ubiquitous or endemic. Um, so we have uh, a finch such as this one where the eye is all swollen and some discharge. Um, this one here at, at this feeder, um, his eye is all protruding from the head and swollen. And these um, tube-like feeders are a common source of transmission of these, this condition because this uh, bacteria-like organism, mycoplasma, uh, will be in the, present in the eye. And as the bird sticks its head in that feeder to grab the, the seeds, the swollen eye touches the outer edge of that um, port in the feeder and it leaves some of the organism behind. Then the next bird sticks its head in and becomes infected. Uh, so a lot of this has been controlled by keeping feeders clean. Uh, and, and in 1994, as I said, this had been a, a poultry disease before, and now it was suddenly affecting house finches. Um, and occasionally we would see it in goldfinches, starlings, or blue jays, but they, it was the one or two birds here and there, never uh, a big kind of epidemic. Um, and so when the rehabilitators saw this new thing happening in grackles and blue jays in, in May in Maryland, they thought, this was a new strain of mycoplasma. And so they treated it the same way, hoping that that would resolve. Um, so the, the normal treatment is a, a, uh, ophthalmic drops for the eyes and then um, this antibiotic tylosin tartrate uh, systemically or in their water 
over a three week period. So, uh, and that will, we've shown has cleared them of it. Unfortunately, um, this, whoops, okay, sorry, it went the wrong way. <laughs> so unfortunately in, in this 2021 event, the birds didn't respond to this treatment. Um, and so then those first birds that were sent for diagnostics, they didn't find any of this um, mycoplasma gallicepticum. So um, there, there, was, there was our first thought of, oh, we might know what it is, but it wasn't. So getting back to, to talking about the event um, a little bit in Pennsylvania, um, around June 18th, uh, Wildlife Futures posted a reporting tool on our network and asked uh, members of the public to report any dead songbirds that they were finding. Uh, we got a phenomenal response. Um, in the first few days, uh, actually, we didn't have, get a whole lot of response for the first week. I think people weren't aware of it. And then a press release went out just before 4th of July. And um, that one weekend alone, we got over a thousand responses. Um, and over the course of the two months, we got over, over 4,000 responses. And these were reports of mostly songbirds. Some of them weren't songbirds. They were reporting other dead birds or wildlife that they found. And we got reports from, it ended up being all 67 counties in Pennsylvania, but also reports from 35 other states, some from Canada and even one from India. Um, it, so the, the difficult task then became sussing out which of these were true, um, truly related to this songbird event. Pretty sure the one report in India had nothing to do with what we were seeing um, here on the East Coast. And similarly, some of the reports of there, there's a dead squirrel in my yard had nothing to do with it. So um, what we did end up going through everything was looking at um, what was um, confirmed. And the, the, the confirmed cases were ones we actually got our, our hands on. And we saw those animals and we knew that they fit the case description. Then we broke out the, the probables, um, which were based on they were, they were the right species, they, they fit the descriptions, and the person reporting could either provide a photo uh, or some other really good description of the, the case. The possibles were ones that sounded like it, but um, we had no photos, the carcass had already been disposed of, and so we had no way of tracking it and, and saying for sure. And then obviously those that are none meant uh, after we contacted the, the reporting party and found out, no, this has nothing else. This ended up being a, a hawk that hit their window um, or something else happening. So it, it wasn't a true case, but still we had, um, you know, a fair number of, of birds in Pennsylvania that were affected. So then we moved on, you know, to, to at RS, it should say at the same time, we're trying to figure out what exactly was happening. So anytime we approach a wildlife case um, or any case in, in medicine, we kind of create this little differential list or our list of rule outs, the things that we wanna see, could it be this or that? And then we'll do the test to, to say yes or no. And so we had our list of, of infectious diseases, certainly, it. It appeared to be spreading from, um, you know, that that focus starting in Maryland D.C. outward to other states. So uh, may have been something infectious, uh, whether it was bacterial, viral, fungal, or parasitic. And then we had to consider also some non-infectious causes. Was it something toxic like a pesticide that was being used widespread over various areas, or something in their food? Um, something causing a nutritional bounce. This, we always think of these things in all cases and, and we kind of rule out nutritional fairly quickly because we can't think what are all these different birds in all over such a large area eating the same that would be different than other years that would suddenly be affecting them. Um, so that's a little less likely. Something metabolic, again, to be 
widespread over this area. Um, same with genetic that didn't seem likely. Trauma, we can have large numbers of, of songbirds uh, actually killed in, in lightning strike events or uh, flying into uh, buildings, um, but not in this kind of uh, distribution and not these young birds that aren't even flying yet. So trauma didn't seem likely, but so to actually start doing the diagnostics and thinking is we were collecting the birds then and doing necropsies, which is kind of the animal equivalent of an autopsy. It literally means to look at death. So we were doing the exams. This picture of this starling is a very good example. You see here of the corneal edema where the eye is all white and cloudy. And then you can see it had some discharge around it, some of that conjunctivitis. So that we saw across all of the cases that we examined in, in our lab. And most of the other labs saw that pretty consistently, some kind of ocular involvement. The only other thing that we saw on these gross necropsies or, or the actual uh, physical exam of the birds was a change in this organ back here on the back side of the um, colon called the bursa of Fabricius. So the bursa is a, an organ of the immune system. It produces B cells, um, which are active in, in responding to infections. And this, the, what we saw was bursal hypertrophy. So the bursa actually looked large. Um, when um, histopathology was done, or when this was looked at under the microscope, they were seeing um, squamous metaplasia, which has been a proliferation of the cells in the bursa. And many of them also had uh, bacteria in the bursa, which is unusual. So even though it responds to infections, but it's producing cells that fight infection, you don't usually get bacteria in this organ. Um, but we were seeing that in a number of cases. So that was a, a bit unusual. Um, one of the things that is known to cause this bursal squamous metaplasia is a vitamin A deficiency. So that did get us wondering, is there some kind of nutritional component? Is something you know, causing them to have this deficiency in their diet? And if so, what? Um, you know, what could be so widespread over multiple states that they aren't getting, is causing them to not get enough vitamin A. So we're, we're not sure about that. And that's something um, the National Wildlife Health Center is trying to develop a test to try to figure out if they can, um, in captive birds, induce these kind of signs with a vitamin A deficiency. Uh, so that is still in progress. Oh, another, I should back up. Um, the final really important component of the necropsy exam is collecting samples to do other tests and look for other diseases. So we used a lot of those tissue samples um, to look for evidence of various infectious diseases. And these are some of them that we looked at. And so now I'm gonna go off on a little tangent for a few minutes and talk about some of these diseases and some of the concerns we might have for them um, in songbirds and other birds. So the first is salmonellosis. Um, most birds carry salmonella in their intestinal tract, but every now and then, especially during harsh winters, um, we can trigger um, an unusual amount of shedding of this bacteria and the birds can succumb to it. Some of them remain asymptomatic carriers and never get sick, whereas others um, will ingest infected feces and then get um, various signs not too unsimilar to the songbird event where they'll get swollen eyelids, they'll get lethargic and weak. Um, so that could possibly look like neurologic signs and die in large numbers. Well, we see this most often at these platform feeders with things like siskins and finches where they're feeding in large numbers and they're, they're pooping afterwards right onto the food and another bird can easily pick it up. Um, 
a big concern at the time was, you know, could this be some kind of avian influenza outbreak? Uh, we've heard other scares of avian influenza. We've had other events in the past. The, the last one was in 2015 in the Midwest. And so uh, we're always on alert for that because it can affect large numbers of birds. Thing that's unusual is, is rarely are songbirds affected. Um, it's usually waterfowl and shorebirds are asymptomatic carriers. So they will have it, not get sick, but shed large numbers of this virus um, through their droppings and oral fluids, any kind of bodily fluids into the environment. And the virus lives really well in the water, which is why we tend to associate it with these, these waterfowl because it's the, the cycle just keeps it alive with these birds eating and feeding in the, in the water environment and then picking it up and shedding it. Um, however, when it gets into other species like raptors that eat um, the, the waterfowl or very importantly, poultry, um, if they get exposed, it can cause very high mortality. So it's the, this highly pathogenic strain of the avian influenza. And so that was a, certainly a concern. Um, there have been, in Europe, they have seen um, thrushes and buntings and red and bulbuls um, become susceptible and die from it, but that's really the only uh, songbird species. So we were thinking maybe it wasn't that, and we weren't getting reports of other species. We tested all of the cases we received and none of them did have it. Um, however, I do want to mention that there is currently a, an outbreak of, um, of high path avian influenza um, happening right now. So yet a, a tangent to my tangent, um, and high path avian influenza H5N1, or this strain of the virus, was, has been circulating in Asia and Europe um, for a couple of years, and it's now moved over um, to North America, was found in Newfoundland, Labrador in November, December. And since then, uh, we started doing heavy surveillance for it in the US. It's been found in um, over 300 wild birds, mostly waterfowl that are, have either been trapped and, and just tested, um, or were, some of them were hunter harvested, um, ducks and geese, that were tested. And again, they were asymptomatic carriers. We haven't seen any deaths from them. However, we have seen uh, some black vultures, uh, a red-shouldered hawk and several eagles that have died with avian influenza now. And again, very importantly is it has gotten into a number of um, poultry flocks, both backyard flocks and um, some commercial flocks. And when this hits, because it is so contagious and, and devastating uh, with high mortality rates, uh, the response in domestic birds is to just euthanize the whole flocks. So as of today, oh, almost 3 million um, poultry have been euthanized in the last few weeks in the U.S. and in attempt to control this and prevent it from spreading to other domestic flocks. So we're probably going to be hearing a lot more about this in the future. So now back to the songbird event, sort of, our, our testing that we were doing. Um, we, because many of these birds were showing neurologic signs, we did consider West Nile virus. You're probably all familiar with that to some degree. Um, the timing wasn't quite right with it being mostly in May through July, early August, because it is transmitted mostly by mosquitoes. However, it can be transmitted um, through direct contact or through fecal ingestion. So we said, well, you know, we don't want to look overlook that as a possibility. Um, songbirds are usually considered a reservoir. The only species of songbird really affected by to any degree are usually jays and crows or the, the corvid family. Um, but they, they other songbirds are rarely ill with it. Uh, we did test all of them and none of them were found, uh, was found to um, be infected. 
So these are just a few pictures of some affected birds with West Nile. You can see that neurologically they, they can't stand. They often have tremors or seizures. Uh, so another um, disease of concern um, is avian paramyxovirus, which causes Newcastle disease. This was, it, it's a highly pathogenic or, or deadly um, uh, disease in poultry, which was why it was a, a big concern. You know, we don't want to um, have something circulating in wild birds that could affect poultry. Uh, it does also occasionally cause die-offs in certain species of, of seabirds, um, most commonly in the U.S. in uh, cormorants. So um, it can also, a strain of this can affect pigeons and cause neurologic disease in them, but again, usually um, not known to affect songbirds. However, it's a viral disease, and as we all know from COVID, uh, viruses love to mutate and form new strains and do new things. So we wanted to make sure this wasn't a new strain of, of Newcastle or, or paramyxovirus. And I, I guess fortunately it wasn't, um, but we were able to rule out that idea. Then along the way, we also did looked um, for any other kinds of common songbird infections like avian pox virus. Um, this can cause um, swellings or these pox-like lesions in areas that are lightly or not feathered. So often around the eyes or here in this robin around the mouth at, at the corner of the beak or on the feet and legs. Um, and this is a very severe case in this barn swallow where the whole face was infected. So this is transmitted by mosquitoes mostly. And so again, we think this is probably a little too early in the season and we really weren't seeing these skin lesions. And none of the affected birds that we, we treated um, did have those. I just kind of want to mention that as a, an, an avian disease that we do see commonly affecting songbirds. We have two more that uh, diseases of concern, especially associated with bird feeders. And these were, this was trichomoniasis which is a, a protozoal or, or single-celled parasite um, that is not too uncommon in doves and other, some other species of songbirds. It's again spread commonly at either these um, platform feeders or ground feeders where what happens is the, the protozoal parasite gets in the lining of the mouth and it produces these large um, plaques or deposits in the mouth. And as you see in the back, maybe you can see in the back of this uh, morning dove's mouth. And this makes it very difficult for the bird to swallow. So if they're hungry, they attempt to eat seed, they pick up the food in the beak, can't swallow it, and some of this um, seed drops back out. And now it's contaminated with the, the parasite and it gets picked up by another bird. So um, that was certainly a concern. Again, we did not see it in any of the cases we examined. Uh, the last disease or, or potentially infectious thing that we were, is, is commonly on our differential list with songbirds is Candida albicans. This is a, a yeast or fungal infection, um, can affect a variety of songbirds. In the rehab situation, we tend to see mostly of it in swifts and finches, occasionally in hummingbirds, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, but this causes a similar signs to that trichomoniasis or that parasite in that it causes a thickening of the um, mucous membranes of the mouth and esophagus. So on this swift that had, had died here, we see um, the esophagus is open and it has all this thick lining to it. So again, uh, the birds have difficulty swallowing um, and succumb to that because they aren't able to feed properly. With hummingbirds, we see it occurring at feeders that aren't kept clean in the heat of the summer where the sugar becomes moldy. And sometimes you'll see that little bl black residue of mold spores uh, on uh, hummingbird feeders. 
And this is the often the candida. And we've seen it get where it will weaken the beak of the hummingbird. So this little bird was on fungal treatment, but he also had a splint on his beak uh, in order to provide some stability as he got over the infection. So those were all the things we didn't find and that we know it wasn't, uh, but that are, as I said, concerns for songbirds and, and birds in general. We did, however, find a few um, infectious agents uh, on our exam and our, our microbiology work. So a number of the birds had a different type of mycoplasma. This is mycoplasma sterni. Um, so it's not quite the same thing as the, the galliseptum that affects the finches. Um, we had seen this before, so we know it's circulating in the population. Um, not that uncommon to find it in blue jays. Uh, in fact, it's often found there without causing disease. So we were wondering, you know, is something changed that now it's causing disease and has it changed and now it's affecting something else besides blue jays? So this is, is still on our list. We're still thinking about this as a, a possibility and we're doing some um, looking into this though it wasn't in all of the cases, which um, makes it a little less likely. The other bacteria that we saw um, quite a bit of was Avibacterium paragallinarum. So this is a huge word, but um, it causes a condition called infectious coryza in poultry. And this is an upper respiratory infection. What was interesting about this is at this same time, last summer, we were seeing um, or hearing reports of quite a number of infectious coryza outbreaks in poultry in Pennsylvania and the surrounding states. So we didn't, and it's not known anywhere in the literature to affect songbirds. So our question then is, has this bacteria changed now and it's suddenly affecting songbirds or do they just have it because it's in the environment from the chickens, uh, the poultry that are affected? And so they're picking it up, picking up the bacteria, but it's not causing infection in them. So we haven't yet quite determined that either. Um, and then on quite a number of the birds had um, E. coli and Enterococcus fecalis. Now, both of these sound to us like bad bugs, you know, nobody wants an E. coli infection, right? Um, but they're pretty common, normal bacterial flora in uh, songbirds. And the location where they were found and the way they were found, uh, our microbiologists and pathologists didn't think that they were the cause of this condition. So then we were also looking at, as I mentioned before, could, could this be a toxin? Is there something out there either in their food or in the environment that might be affecting them? If so, was it a pesticide? Um, there was a, a lot of um, heavy use of pesticides in some areas as is common in summers and early May as people are you know, trying to kill everything except what they want to be in their garden. Um, and then there were also um, a lot of people out using pesticides due to the emergence of the cicadas last year. So that idea got kicked around a lot. Um, we did screen all the cases for the common pesticides that we know were being used last summer, and they didn't show up in any of the birds. We had no pesticide residues from them. We also screened for heavy metals as metals like lead can cause these neurologic signs we didn't find that. Um, uh, oddly enough, kind of in our uh, general surveys for toxins, um, we did find a fair number of birds, uh, over 50% of them had some um, DDE, which is the breakdown product of DDT. And as we know, that was banned in this country in 1972. Uh, so the fact that we're finding it in you know, two to three week old chicks um, is a little disconcerting. Um, we know it's obviously still in the environment, but 
um, to find it in 50% of the birds at that age is a little surprising. Um, PCBs like aerochlor and heptachlor were, uh, have not been used in this country since the, the late 70s and 80s, um, but they do persist in the soil. And so, you know, that's a concern. Could they, it, again, it was in like 50% of the birds, not all of them. Um, is that doing something, even if it's not doing something to me, that's concerning that we're finding these chemicals uh, in these young animals. So then came the big question, could the cicadas themselves have something to do with it? Um, there was lots of discussion about that because it was a big um, you know, 17 year cicada year. And so um, you know, was it these brood X cicadas? Here's a, a map provided by the USGS of the cases they knew of in um, songbirds by, um, I think this was early June, um, early to mid June. And these are um, birds that had been sent into the national lab for diagnostics. And you see them spread here, you know, the, the DC, Maryland area, some in Delaware and, and Southeast US, uh, Pennsylvania, and then um, across Ohio and Indiana. So we got a map of the cicadas from this cicada safari org and same cicadas are kind of in that same general region. There's a gap here um, throughout the center of Pennsylvania and West Virginia, and there's a gap here in the cases in that same area. Kind of makes you wonder there that there's at least that, is it coincidental or is something going on? So the things we wanna look at is, is it that somehow the cicadas themselves, is it somehow pesticide use on them? Though we had pretty much eliminated that idea since we found no pesticide residues in them. Then came the question, was it this massospora fungus? Um, this is a, a fungus that in, affects the cicadas. So this cicada has died from this massospora infection and it has, um, one of the interesting things it does is it literally causes the back end of the cicada to fall off. Um, and it produces a neurotoxin and causes the cicadas to spin. So we're thinking, was that the neurotoxin that's affecting the, the cicadas? Um, we were not able to find a lab capable of, of finding or diagnosing that neurotoxin. Uh, from the fungus yet. So we're, we're still looking into that possible aspect and we have lots of cicadas in the freezer to, to test. Um, but was there something else going on? Were these cicadas emerging from 17 years under the ground and bringing up things like PCBs and, and DDE um, or something entirely else? So again, here's a, another distribution map of the cicadas and where they were found. And so again, it seems to overlie those states that had cases. But then kind of a twist to that, on the other hand, um, had reports from kestrel banders that were checking their boxes with kestrel chicks. And if you can see here in the bottom, it's just layered with inches of cicada wings because this, the, kestrels were feeding tons of these cicadas to their chicks. And we had nice, fat, healthy chicks that the, the, the monitors were checking their boxes regularly and they know that these birds survived fine to fledging. So the cicadas and or anything that they were carrying didn't seem to affect the kestrels, whereas it you know, was affecting um, songbirds in the same area. So our last big diagnostic push was um, our, in August, we were able to contact um, CZ's Biohub, a company in California that did, was able to do some metagenomics work for us. So, so metagenomics, if you're not familiar, is that the study of all the genetic material that they can obtain from a sample um, and, and analyzing what, what all is there. So to do this, we collected several different tissues from the affected birds. We placed them in this solution called um, 
RNA DNA shield. And then this was homogenized to, to break it down in, um, and then at, at CZ Biohub. And they extracted the DNA here to leave just RNA in the material. And then they analyzed and mapped out um, the RNA, compared it to um, genetic material normally found in birds and eliminated that. And that left them with this whole list of RNA sequences uh, that they could then determine which might be found in pathogens or other organisms that might cause disease. So they produce these heat maps as a result, which mean nothing to me, especially with this small, um, but they have interpreted it for me this way and said that these were kind of the, the pathogens or the this organisms that had the highest hits or their, their RNA was most prevalent in the bird samples. Um, we found a lot of of this Avibacterium perigallinarum, 54 out of 80 samples had it. So this right here was again, a concern because we do know it's a pathogen. Um, it doesn't culture well in the lab. So we're, we're not surprised we didn't find it in more of the cases in the lab. Um, Mycoplasma sterni, again, from the, uh, the blue jays was found in over half the birds. So that's um, still a big concern as a possible cause. And then what was interesting to me is that all of them had evidence of this massospora fungus from the, the cicada. Now, all that probably means is that the, the fungus and the cicadas were everywhere at the time. We don't know whether it causes any disease or whether maybe it causes something like it suppresses the immune system in these young birds and makes them susceptible to other infections. Uh, we're really not, not sure what's happening there. So what we realized in looking at this is we don't know, you know how prevalent is something like Mycoplasma sterni in healthy birds. We know what occurs sometimes, but is it really that common? And so um, ideally, we would want to do some control metagenomics and have the same species, the same location, but healthy birds, maybe those that you know, had died from trauma, um, but had no signs of this infection, and, and ideally the same age, so also fledglings. However, as I said, we ran this first test in August, so by the time we finally knew, um, the reality was we weren't able to get those samples. We were able to find birds of the same species, same general area, not the exact location, but Maryland, Southeast Pennsylvania and such. Um, and we were able to find otherwise healthy birds. These were birds that were um, got maybe caught by a cat or flew into someone's window and died. Um, and, but unfortunately, because this is now into August, September, um, all the birds that we had were adults. We didn't have any fledglings of this age to compare. So um, we did submit those as the controls. This is an initial um, heat map that they produced just this week. And unfortunately, this is still currently in progress. I, I really hoped that I'd be able to share the results with you. Um, when we set this meeting up, I was like, oh, by May March, we'll certainly have the re results. But um, their data hasn't all been analyzed yet. And so I'm hoping to get the results in the next week or so. And as soon as we do, we'll certainly share those through you, for you um, through Dr. Amen. So I guess one, one lesson that we've, we've learned from all of this is that no matter what the cause of this, um, feeder maintenance is always a good idea because not just whatever caused the event in last summer, but all the other diseases that might be out there. Um, the handout that I provided you said, a one to 30 ratio of bleach is, is good, but there have been um, several studies since that came out that have shown it really ideally should be a one to 10. Um, so one part bleach to 10 parts water um, and soak that for a good 10 minutes after washing it first and, and removing any organic matter. Um, if you're cleaning really regularly and you don't have that 
any kind of you know buildup, uh, the one to thirty bleach solution is is okay. Or you can even wipe them down with a the ten percent bleach wipes and just let that air dry. And just a note to remember personal hygiene when cleaning, wearing gloves like this, um, because some of these can infect, uh, potentially infect people as well, or you could transmit from one area to another. So the, uh, to kind of wind up the overall impact of, of this outbreak, um, really don't know, uh, you know, it, it was common species. Uh, it was only the young. It was a brief time that it affected limited regions. You could have an outbreak or affected birds in, in one neighborhood and you know a few miles away, none of the songbirds were affected. So we think there's very little overall effect on the population. Um, unfortunately, there's, there's lots of other things out there that are imperiling songbirds, um, whether it's window strikes or songbird or, um, or cat, uh, cats and other predators. Um, and the, this report that came out by Rosenberg et al. in 2018, it indicates a net loss approaching 3 billion birds over a 48 year period. That, that's 29% decrease in, in relative population size since 1970. So if you take the number of birds that were present in our environment in 1970, currently we're at about 29% of that. So if you think there are fewer birds now than you remember seeing and hearing 50 years ago, sadly you're correct. Um, so we don't need the songbird event or anything else further de decreasing um, their numbers. So my conclusions as is, is no real conclusions other than that we now have a lot of questions. You know, is this gonna occur again? When, where, uh, what species? Is it gonna happen this year? Is it gonna happen 17 years from now? Then we would know it might be the cicadas, but hopefully we can continue to, to work on this and, and find something sooner rather than having to wait 17 years to, to confirm some thoughts. Um, and with that, I just want to thank the many partners who contributed samples or, or diagnostic efforts. And, and thank you for inviting me and for listening. Um, I'll gladly attempt to answer any questions you might have.